Thank you, Mary. Um, I've been tasked with commenting, as she said, on the biology, but really I'm going to comment on much of what we heard today, more specifically these recent speakers, because I think they're all of a piece uh, in ter terms of hearing about some what we might call critical dimensions of personality disorder. Today we heard a lot about affective dysregulation. Maybe we'll hear more about other kinds of uh, dimensions related to other disorders than borderline. We heard some about impulsive aggressive uh, disorders. And these really cut across diagnoses, and the biology may cut across diagnoses, which is a theme in NIMH of the RDOCS proposal. And they allow us to look, I think, at a variety of things, including antecedents like genetics and environmental insults or trauma, and you've heard in many of these talks about the interaction between the two. And then we can think about then what are the circuits involved, which imaging allows us to see? What are the modulators of these circuits in terms of neuropeptides, neurotransmitters? What are the psychologic paradigms that can pick up these differences, which we heard from Jill Hooley, a number of others? And then ultimately, we want to enhance treatment. So we want to know, can we identify new treatment targets, new interventions, pharmacologic perhaps, but also psychosocial? Now, a big part of identifying treatments is also thinking about predictors. And um, predictors may help us select the appropriate treatment, and there's a lot of discussion about individual differences and how we can take advantage of those in, in selecting treatments. But I will say we're in very early stages for this kind of work. Um, I've been on the interventions committee at NIMH, and there's a big push to do these kinds of studies with biomarker or other predictors. But there's really been very little that has come out to date um, because it's a hard task. And um, ultimately, we also want to know mediators, and you've heard some about that. In other words, are what are the physiologic or other mechanisms by which these therapies work? And um, so these can all be couched in terms of a, a central vulnerability in the case of uh, borderline, we see the affective instability, the impulsive aggression. We see key circuits and regions. The amygdala comes up over and over again, the insula. Uh, if Harold Koningsberg were to be here, he would have told you about connectivity between the amygdala and the insula as partially predicting things such as habituation. Both uh, Harold's work and Mary Ann and Aaron's, which you'll hear about tomorrow, speak to a number of characteristics that are closely related in terms of amygdala and affective reactivity, which is its clinical correlate, which is there are differences, as we've heard, and, and Jill summarized, Mary Ann summarized, in sensitivity to emotional stimuli, the intensity of the response, the recovery, which is slower in disorders like borderline, but also the sensitization or desensitization or habituation which occurs in normals, but doesn't really occur in the same way as uh, in borderline personality disorder. And these can have tremendous implications for treatment, as Mary Ann illustrated in her talk today, because in fact, it's the non-habituation, the heightened reactivity, the increased intensity of response that we can see in blink startle physiologically as in Aaron's work, or in m imaging of the amygdala, as it Mary Ann and Aaron pointed out, um, that seem to be predictors and mediators of the response to treatment. So in fact, um, we do know something about the physiology. Now it is true that uh, we don't yet have perfect predictors. As I said, there are very few biomarker predictors at this point. I think Mary Ann had a, uh, a very robust finding there. It's not altogether surpri uh, surprising that, in fact, not everybody who was amygdala hyper responders responded to the treatment, but it did seem that everybody who was a hyper responder um, responded. So it may be that you need a certain kind of physiology to respond to the DBT, and you would imagine also to emotional regulation therapy, as we heard from Kim Gretz today, and that, in fact, there may be other conditions needed, uh, other factors that uh, dictate amenability of therapy. For example, an amygdala um, hyper responder who didn't know English, for example, might not respond, but at another level that's less obvious, who had 
severe alexithymia, couldn't articulate things verbally. So there may be other things required to get a response. But this is the kind of data that we can begin to formulate better treatment selections for. And of course, the question about whether amygdala is high or low in activity, um, I think does depend on a lot of concomitant factors because we know psychopaths have low amygdala response and they're often comorbid in very aggressive patients. But more appropriate, I think, for the borderline is the high dissociators. And they damp out, in fact, incoming stimuli. And it also may be, if you look at the slides of the responders and non-responders, as was pointed out, that some of the patients, in fact, the non-responders, seem to show greater reactivity after the DBT. Are they getting a deleterious effect? Is, in fact, the DBT wearing down, if you will, a little bit of their dissociative defenses so they actually weaken something that's, for them, relatively adaptive, whereas for people who actually can utilize the um, tools that DBT gives them, they actually can show greater habituation. Well, these are the kinds of questions we need answers to. We're not looking for perfectly sensitive, specific predictors. We're looking for tools to begin to understand what are the predictors and mediators of response to come up with better treatments. And what we need to find out, and we heard about issues of comparison treatments, et cetera, is, okay, what are the critical ingredients? We know that, in fact, comparator treatments are not going to be exactly the same as our treatment of, in, uh, of interest. They have to be quite different, but they're not going to be totally different. And can we isolate? Can we even look in a dose-dependent way at what are those critical ingredients? Well, those will require some hypothesis-generating studies and much larger samples than we have now. But we may be able to ultimately, if we can do a treatment selection kind of approach, see who would respond, what what is the critical ingredient for their response, and this is a way that we can move on to better and more successful treatments. Um, Jill Hooley's work actually underscored again the uh, issue of the negative affects, the affects of dysregulation. Um, you wonder about why there was that little initial response in quad eight, although it wasn't in putamen, and what happened. I'm not sure, I think that she had said these are kinds of praises that she actually hears in working with the families and, and others in w who are close to these patients. And you wonder if, one, this is not consonant with their world, with their view of their self, but also if you read the statements, maybe there's a question of, as I read that one praise from, that, that was the example that she used in her paradigm, um, I think it ended with, uh, um, and this is what I love about her, or when she's like that. So you wonder, is, are they afraid that another sh the other shoe is going to drop, that there's an implicit part of the things that they don't like about her? Is there an expectation or a fear of something disappointing? It would be interesting to know how these people cognize what they heard and how that worked in terms of their physiology. The other kind of thought that I think Antonio mentioned was the alexithymia these people have. They certainly have a relative incapacity for all of these reasons to get a sense of interoceptive satisfaction from this kind of praise and thus secondarily elaborated in terms of labeling those experiences. So I think this is raises as many questions as it answers in terms of why do we have this anomalous response, but I think it, it may be another clue into this disjunction between the subjective experience and articulation of it that the person with borderline personality disorder has and the, what their underlying physiology is. And um, finally, I just want to uh, comment on Antonia New's presentation, which I think was a, was a very nice kind of uh, view into possibilities of genetics, but also I think particularly around oxytocin and social processing which is a, a very exciting and, and novel area that, that um, she's worked on that Marcetta Perez really has, has taken the lead of in our group. And I think it illustrates, again, the importance of the dimensional point of view, the, the point that we can actually begin to identify genetic concomitants of some of these disorders, although this is very much in its infancy, 
and the possibility that they may generate um, new novel kinds of treatments that we hadn't thought about. And she mentioned a number in conjunction with the BDNF finding as well as, of course, possible use of oxytocin itself. But I think the whole question of hypomentalizing, hypermentalizing, and where you are on the curve illustrates that we don't expect identical responses in all individuals, and it may depend where you are on the curve. And this is true for a whole number of physiologic, psychologic functions like working memory, um, attention, et cetera, where you have an optimum. And where you are in relation to that optimum may determine your response to an intervention. And, and the same curve has been shown, for example, with dopamine and naturalistic variation in the Dalmet genotype um, and a host of other physiologic and psychologic functions. So we're really getting more sophisticated in how we conceptualize, how we're going to think about treatment, and that's really our ultimate goal. And biology, I hope you see, can be a tool, but we need to think about the biology in different ways than we have been. And I think we've heard a number of approaches that are promising today that I hope will continue to bear fruit in future treatment interventions.